once again, good morning for those who joined uh, later for whatever reason. No. Does it work? Yeah. This is track two, management and defense track. And I'm very happy to have once again uh, Ivan in Heidelberg, who knows his stuff. That's pretty much all I'm going to say. And uh, whatever he brings us usually is about real life stuff. And this is uh, what I really appreciate at Troopers. Ivan, go ahead. Yeah, well, with the software defined stuff, there's so much hype, I had to add real life into the title so that at least some people would believe that it really is real. Um, anyway, last year or two, I focused a lot on software-defined whatever. It was primarily software-defined networking, and software-defined security is just a natural extension of that because the same principles and everything else applies. Um, Actually, last year I was running probably 10 workshops on software-defined networking, vaccinating over 200 people against that stupidity. Um, so, not bad. On the other hand, I also tried to do something else because, you know, constructive criticism is great, as we've heard. But actually telling people what they can do is even better. So I started collecting real-life use cases where someone is actually using something in production or testing or whatever. And a few of those I'll talk about here. And uh, for those of you who are not familiar with what I do, I would kindly suggest that you go to this website. And in there, you'll find a podcast I publish occasionally where I talk, about, talk with people who actually do stuff. Some of them are vendors. I apologize for that, but sometimes they have something smart to say, surprisingly. No, some people are really good. Uh, a lot of them are open source developers, and they do amazing stuff. And some of them are engineers running production networks and doing some crazy stuff. Where you just listen to that and you go like, wow. And you know what's the beauty of this, of all this software defined whatever and network automation whatever stuff? That every time I get a great idea and I write about it, someone goes like, yeah, I've been doing that for years. So there is nothing new in this universe. That's the point of this whole <laughs> intro. And uh, there are a lot of people doing crazy stuff that no one knows about, which also means that you should consider start doing that same stuff. And I do my best to bring it to the forefront. And uh, if anyone is aware of anyone doing some crazy stuff, let me know. With that said, what is software-defined security? It's mostly marketing. It's bullshit. However, there is one thing that you should take away from this presentation if you forget everything else. Namely, everything that you can define well enough so that you can take uh, someone from uh, high school or whatever, and tell him, do that, can usually also be automated. And that's what a lot of those people I've been talking about are doing. They are automating stuff so that, A, they get back their lives, and B, even more importantly, and I got that message from Martin over here, <laughs> who uh, managed to certify his public cloud for FDA workloads, right? Which is like mission impossible. <laughs> it cannot be done. It was probably proven that it cannot be done. Anyway, what he taught me uh, two years ago, I think, at Troopers is this. If you automate, then it's repeatable. So every time you run something, modulo timing bugs and whatever, you'll get the same results. 
So you eliminate human errors. Obviously, you can't eliminate software errors, but once you fix a software bug, that error will never, ever appear again. A different one will. But uh, with humans, every time you are disturbed with, by a phone call and you have five terminal windows open, who knows in which terminal window you'll type reload. And sometimes you type it in the wrong one, and it's your core switch. And next, once you can repeat things consistently, you can actually validate them. And that was his message, right? So you can actually say, I know I do things this way because I can validate that every time I run this process, these are the results, okay? Second thing I want to mention is, this is from my friend Jeremy Stretch, and it applies to networking, but uh, it equally applies to security. You know that hierarchy of needs where we start with food, drink, and a few other things down here? And you end with art up there? So he applied the same pyramid to the network. And he said, well, first you need something that works, that's prerequisite. Then you need something that's operated, which means that actually someone looks at it and verifies that it works. So this is the boring stuff. Uh, th this is where we are today, in networking and in security. And then he said, but you need to move on. The first thing is abstraction of state. So instead of thinking about firewall rules in terms of subnets and port numbers, you should start thinking of firewall rules in terms of this group of hosts has to access that group of hosts over HTTP. Because that's how the application developers see stuff. Okay? And then, of course, behind the scenes, it gets translated into this set of IP addresses can access those set of IP addresses on port 80. But no one should know that. Why should someone know that HTTP is port 80? And if you take, and I think I have an example later on from Amazon Web Services where they actually give you protocol names that someone can relate to and not port numbers. And they they actually know that HTTP runs over TCP. So you can never request to run HTTP over UDP. Okay? Uh, next, once you get that, and you know what you want to do, you can start automating stuff. So instead of uh, your application developers opening a ticket in your system saying, we need access from this subnet to that subnet on port 80. They should have a web interface where they would say, this group of VMs should talk all with that group of VMs over HTTP. And when they click submit, it's done. There is no human intervention. And that's how the Amazons of the world do things. That's also how a lot of enterprise people already do things. And finally, the holy grail is automated remediation. Something bad happens and Skynet kicks in and fixes your network or not, or cuts you off because it thinks you're an idiot. So this is the holy grail, and I have a few examples of what people are doing in this area. Okay, and the next thing you'll see on some of the subsequent slides is this slider. How real is this? From works best in PowerPoint and nowhere else. <laughs> which is where many vendor technologies live, <laughs> to it's actually in widespread deployment. And I don't 
think I have any of the things I'll talk about in this stage, but yes, I have things that are in production. Although, well, you might consider Amazon Web Services to be widespread, widespread deployment. <laughs> I would say that's fair. Anyway, I'll start with an easy one, micro-segmentation. This is what every vendor is talking about. VMware account manager is knocking on your door and he's telling you about micro-segmentation. And then Cisco's account manager is knocking on your door and he's telling you that, well, now ACI can do micro-segmentation. And no, you really shouldn't buy VMware because whatever. And of course, the VMware guy is telling you the same thing. You shouldn't buy Cisco because whatever. So let's forget that. Let's focus on the technicalities. This is a thing that I would put into the abstraction of state, and you'll see why. And this is a thing that is running in production. I have a few customers that run NSX with micro-segmentation in production. I know some, a system integrator from UK, and he's also said he has like 10 customers running NSX in production. And the primary use case is always micro-segmentation. It starts there. So what is this? Traditionally, I guess that everyone's network looks like this, right? The data center network. <coughs> you have some VLANs, and you connect some things to those VLANs, and then you have some stuff between, <coughs> which is a combo of load balancer and firewall, and usually there are two of them for redundancy and to increase the complexity and to pay more to the vendors. And usually you would use some VLANs or some people even have routers here for every segment. And I think I mentioned last year on the IPv6 talks and uh, a lot of other people have already mentioned this problem. The problem is that inside here, you don't do any inspection. This is your security zone and they all trust each other. They're one big happy family. Which might be okay if you wouldn't, you wouldn't cra have that crazy cousin in there. <laughs> Namely, what people do is they put different, let's say, th this is the worst part, different web servers from different applications in the same security zone and someone breaks into one of them, and if you haven't taken IPv6 countermeasures, it's game over. Totally. So, be careful. Uh, anyway, um, we all know that this is broken, but uh, there are things that you can do, like private VLANs. We all love them, right? Or you can really go for micro-segmentation and uh, either put every application into its own VLAN and that totally upsets the networking people because now they have 4,000 VLANs everywhere. Um, or you can try to do some even smarter stuff, but there is no good solution. The problem is that we're doing filtering in the wrong place. Well, honestly, we should be doing filtering in the servers, but that's a different story. Anyway, so micro-segmentation is a very simple idea. Instead of having this central filter, why don't we put a filter in front of every vulnerable point? And of course, you would say, well, I could do the same thing inside the virtual machine with Linux IP tables or Windows firewall. But the problem is that if someone breaks into the virtual machine, the first thing he'll do is turn that off. So unless you think no one can break into your virtual machines, you better have some other precautions. And uh, putting the filters just outside of the virtual machines is one of those things that you can do. Now, Every vendor will tell you how their thingy is the best thing invented since sliced bread, as the Americans say. Uh, the reality is all of them are more or less state foolish firewalls. 
And uh, the good ones actually track TCP and UDP sessions. The bad ones don't do even that. And no one does any deep packet inspection because that's too CPU intensive. For example, Palo Alto has a solution that I'll show in two slides where you can actually do deep packet inspection between uh, virtual machines even running on the same host. Total throughput of that solution is one gigabit per host, which sort of doesn't sound right if you have two 10 gigabit interfaces, right? And it burns four CPU cores just to process one gigabit of traffic, which also sounds like a waste of resources. So yeah, I know that every security engineer wants to have deep packet inspection everywhere, but let's be realistic, sometimes you don't need it. Okay, uh, these things are usually implemented in the hypervisors because that's where the new network edge is. You want to be able to control the edge, okay? So you have to put these things in the hypervisors unless, of course, you are a networking vendor. And if you're a networking vendor, you want to put everything in the hardware because you're selling hardware. So you're trying to put these things into your top of rack switch. And then of course someone goes like, yeah, excuse me, but what about two VMs running on the same uh, host? And you go like, you don't need to care about that. Uh, and oh, by the way, did you realize how well our solution works with bare metal? Yeah, yeah, but I have these two VMs on this host. You don't need to care about that. So there are two solutions. The first one is you actually put each VM into a separate VLAN, so you pull all the traffic to the top of rack switch where you can do filtering. And the second thing is you actually give up and you admit that you need a switch in the hypervisor. And a certain company I was referring to without naming them explicitly, recently launched just such a virtual switch which can do micro-segmentation in the hypervisor and not on top of rack switch. So they effectively admitted that uh, doing it uh, in, in hardware is not the smartest idea. Anyway, the nice trick here is that everything is centrally managed. It's not run centrally, it's not a central choke point, but it's managed centrally. And because these things are usually tightly coupled with the uh, virtualization orchestration systems, the policies actually move with the VMs. Anyone wants to know the details? I did a uh, NSX micro-segmentation podcast with, I think, Brett Headland, who was still working at uh, VMware that time. And uh, I grilled him on the details. And it turns out that if uh, you have a VM that's protected, they deploy the policy on all hosts within the cluster. Because a VM can move randomly within the cluster due to uh, DRS. Uh, but between the clusters, they don't because that would just overload all the ESX hosts. So when you move a VM from here to there, during the VM migration event, there is this moment where they go like, hey, hey stop. We need to download the policies here first. Okay, now you can move. So it's all automatic. Uh, and from your perspective, it looks like one central pool of uh, firewall rules. The beauty of this is though that because you can apply firewall rules to, for example, in NSX case, the port groups, you can get any granularity you wish. You can even create firewall rules that apply to a certain group of virtual machines. And you can even use attributes like uh, VM operating system. So you can say all Windows virtual machines cannot speak on port 80 because we know they have a bug or something. Uh, the benefits, you protect every single server in your network. You centralize the security policies and you can get rid of 4,000 VLANs because you stop using VLANs as a security mechanism. 
and every networking engineer will be grateful. Uh, everyone has something like this, literally everyone. Uh, in op well, it all started with uh, OpenStack and CloudStack using IP tables on KVM hosts. It's built in there. You use security groups in OpenStack or CloudStack and use KVM as the, uh, the hypervisor. It gets installed. They work. They worked for the last 10 years. Only no one called that micro-segmentation because we didn't realize it should be called micro-segmentation. Well, now we know. Now we call it micro-segmentation. Um, NSX was the second one. Uh, Microsoft added full-blown stateful firewall, well, stateful in the sense of tracking uh, TCP UDP port numbers, uh, to Hyper-V. Nuage with their uh, VSP does that, Juniper with Contrail does that, and Cisco recently with the AVS, which is Nexus uh, 1000v4 ACI. And uh, they call this application virtual switch, I think, because this, this is all ap application-centric, so it has to be application virtual switch. Uh, they also do micro-segmentation in the hypervisor. And Cisco can do micro-segmentation if you want it on the top of rack switch, which is technologically totally equivalent to deploying access control lists on switch ports. The benefit is that it's managed from the central controller. And the other benefit is that you actually think in terms of endpoint groups and what the traffic between the endpoint groups should be and not in terms of uh, subnets and port numbers. Okay, whenever you're evaluating such a solution, always ask these questions. How are the security rules created? So who creates them? Is, is it multi-tenant or not? And most of these products are not multi-tenant. You have this one pool of security rules for the whole data center. Uh, is the state moved with the VM? And what, by the way, how stateful is this thing? Is the filtering in the kernel module, so in the virtual switch, or is it done in a user land VM, which will kill the performance totally? Um, do you need a control VM per hypervisor? Is it involved in the flow setup, which will inc uh, increase latency? And what happens when the control VM fails? Uh, VMware had this great product, in double quotes, called vShield app. And initially, if the control VM failed, uh, well, the VMs couldn't talk to the world. Hooray, we protected them. And later they fixed that, and uh, in the typical VMware uh, manner, they fixed the thing by adding a switch where you could decide if the control VM fails, whether the VMs will be isolated or unprotected. Which is like great choice, right? Uh, now with NSX, VMware actually did the right thing. They have an in-kernel firewall and so that the, the firewall traffic no longer traverses the user land. They don't even run the VM because they own the hypervisor. They are the only ones who can run user mode processes directly on hypervisor. Everyone else needs to, do, to use a virtual machine. So they have this user world agent here that would talk to the controller and pull down the policies. Like most everyone else, they can do layer three, layer four filtering, um, layer two R filtering. Now this is no longer shared by everyone. So some solutions can do source IP address validation, others can't. Check what your solution is doing. And they added DHCP snooping and ARP snooping in uh, NSX 6.2 which, by the way, was on Nexus uh, 1000v for years. So they're always sort of playing a catch-up between themselves. And VMware can actually spell IPv6. So this part of NSX works for IPv4 and IPv6. Uh, Microsoft uh, was dual stack forever. Not sure about the others. Contrail, I think, got IPv6 support. Uh, I will not even comment on state of IPv6 support in OpenStack. 
Um, so that's it. And recently, well, recently, maybe a year ago, they added the capability to have third party VMs that would do the deep packet inspection. Now the beauty of this solution is that they first do their own filtering in the kernel module and then the action of these rules could be drop, permit, log, or send for further inspection. And that's where Palo Alto or now also Checkpoint Firewall hooks in. So you can process majority of the stuff here based on port numbers. And if you think that something deserves deeper inspection like HTTP session from somewhere, then you send that thingy to the Palo Alto firewall that can actually look into the HTTP GET request and say, well, no, 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 I don't like what you're sending me. In public clouds, micro segmentation, only they didn't call it that, was a given for ages. This is actually from uh, Amazon. And you see that they talk about HTTP, not port 80. They tell you it's port 80. If you select HTTP, you can't even change the protocol because, hey, HTTP runs on TCP. And uh, when you click Save, guess what? It's deployed in production immediately. Okay? Uh, also, they have very simple rules, as you can see. No application level gateway. They, will, they don't care about SIP. They don't care about FTP. They don't care about all the crazy stuff that some vendor might be doing, like dynamic port numbers. If you don't like our solution, you can go to some other cloud. We have enough customers. Thank you. Honestly, that's their approach. Why should we invest time and money into developing something for your stupid application that no one else will ever use? You cannot pay us enough. Uh, OpenStack and CloudStack have the same things if you're running on KVM. Not sure about the user interface. Now, moving further up the stack, still in production deployments, automating micro-segmentation. So every single one of the solutions I mentioned has some API that you can use, which means that every single one of them can be automated with something. Um, Amazon has well-known API, CloudStack, OpenStack, VMware, NSX, Hyper-V uses PowerShell, uh, we actually configured firewall, well, packet filters in those days, uh, using PowerShell on Hyper-V probably like three years ago. So every single one of those solutions has an API that you can use. Some people will write their own tools. Some people will use solutions like Cloudify. Cloudify is one of those nice solutions where you describe your whole application stack in a text file. It's like, I need to deploy the web VMs and images are here and they belong to this segment. And I need to deploy uh, application servers and the images are here and they are in this segment. And I need to deploy database servers and the images are here and they are in this segment. And these are the security rules. And then Cloudify was working only on OpenStack and CloudStack. Now they added vSphere deployments and vCloud deployments. So once you have this file, you go like, go. And it does the stuff. Now the beauty of this approach is that the developers have to write that file. So once the developers say we're done, you go like, okay, where's the deployment file? Oops. Then once they finish writing the deployment file and you verify that the security rules are in place, okay, you take the whole thing and you move it to test environment and you go like, 
deploy. Did it work? No. Go back to square one, fix it. Once the deployment file successfully deploys that in test, you move it to production. Um, a lot of people are using Ansible. Cloudify is like a higher level tool because it thinks about application stacks, whereas Ansible is a lower level um, generic automation tool. Uh, but I love it because it allows me, as a networking guy, to do almost anything on my network. I can automate. As, as long as I can do SSH into a box, I can automate that box with Ansible. Which is like, I can do almost anything on any box that any vendor produced in the last few years. Uh, PowerShell is another option for, obviously, Hyper-V, as well as vSphere and NSX if you're a Windows shop. Uh, as I said, these things work well if you can push it back to developers to write the deployment files. So if the developers throw something in your lap and you have to reverse engineer what they need, you automated the last 5% of your job. Which is cool, but you still have to do 95% manually which is figuring out, okay, what were they thinking? Anyway, for Ansible fans, this is how uh, an OpenStack security rule would look described in Ansible. Uh, I have this security group in this cloud. It has to be present. It's the name. And then I have some uh, rules that go in there. The beauty of uh, this approach is that I don't have to, it's pretty low level, but I don't have to know the API. I can easily move between clouds. I could even, well, this would be a bit harder because I would have to change the module names, but I could move from OpenStack to Amazon, for example. And then you just go like, do this, and it happens. Uh, then there are things that still make sense. So we are still somewhere up here, but I wouldn't say they are anywhere close to production. Namely, validating what you did. Uh, Amazon launched their Amazon Inspector. So they, have, they launched two tools sometime last year. And the other one, I think, is in production, and this one is still in early release or whatever. So the other tool is pretty simple. You define your own rules, and then they would check the com compliance with those rules and report any mismatches okay? for anything you deploy in their cloud. Now, that one is cool. It helps you, but you have to do all the hard work. You have to define the rules. And, you know, they run like 50 different services, and every service has, I don't know how many parameters, so defining those rules, good luck. You'll always miss something. And this is their attempt at sort of artificial intelligence, if you wish. So they have predefined hundreds of rules that they think make sense. And then they would run all those rules against your workload, and they would tell you what they think you're doing wrong. And of course, you can add your own rules, or you can turn off their rules because you know better. Like, they're only running that infrastructure, right? I know my applications. Uh, but this is a nice first step. When you deploy something on Amazon, you go like, what do you think about it? Oh, only 50 errors. Good. I'm good. Um, NSX uh, does something, tries to do something similar with uh, Splunk integration, but they took a totally different approach, which I don't like, by the way. Which is, OK, we will deploy the distributed firewall. And we will just log all the sessions. We will not stop anything. 
and all those log messages go into Splunk and we'll analyze them in Splunk and we'll get the information who is talking with whom on which port and then we'll turn that information into firewall rules and we'll deploy them and our network will be secure. Okay? Sounds great, right? No. <laughs> uh, there is this academic result called the halting problem, which states that you can never look at a program and uh, decide whether it will ever stop or not. And uh, paraphrasing that in networking terms, you can never look at the traffic and decide that this is all the valid traffic that you need. Because there will always be something like the year-end batch job, which uses some extra connectivity that you haven't seen for a year. And of course, it will crash if you use this approach. And it may be the most important job run in your company. <laughs> but it happens to run once a year. So I wouldn't use this approach. It looks great in PowerPoint, <laughs> but. Uh, then there are various DOS and DDoS detection and mitigation tools. And uh, they range all the way from um, proof of concept to production deployments. And they range all the way th from some abstraction and uh, automation to automatic remediation. Now, what is probably the most well-known tool in this category is Cloudflare. You just plug them in and they work. You get a DDoS attack, you don't even know. I was amazed at how well this thing actually works. So what they do is they have like 60 data centers around the world and all data centers advertise the same IP address. So a US hacker cannot attack a European data center because his traffic automatically goes to the US data center. So they can survive, I think they survived like 400 gig of continuous DDoS attack. And it was like, oh, what a nice day. It's only 400 gig. Uh, I think they're like one of the few worldwide that can survive that. Uh, they totally automated everything. Um, and for example, if some new malware comes out, like something is attacking WordPress sites or Recently, I think it was, well, WordPress is all the time attacked. Uh, I think it was Joomla sites or something. Uh, they would themselves write the detection tool and automatically kill all that traffic without you ever worrying. Uh, you want to know uh, more about them? They have a blog and they post a lot of really cool technical stuff because it's a recruitment tool for them. Every blog post goes like, would you love, uh, ends with like, would you love to work on this cool stuff? Yeah, we are hiring. Which is totally cool. Uh, and you can do automatic adjustments uh, through their API. So for example, you could say, yeah, I hate Cl Cloudflare for whatever reasons, but if I, I, if I see I'm under attack, I can automatically call their API, they have to own your DNS, otherwise this doesn't work. And then the next moment, all the, tra the traffic would go through their data center. Well, modulo TTL, TTL caching in DNS. But you can flip a switch and the traffic eventually gets there. And uh, someone wrote a module in Ansible, of course that allows you to interact with Cloudflare API. So you just change some parameters, you run the Ansible playbook, your traffic is redirected. Uh, this is in deployment at 
multiple, at least academic institutions. It's an open source software, so you can download it and play with it. The problem these guys had was that they were using open source IDSs, and those IDSs were only able to process one gig of traffic. So of course you would say, yeah, let's put some switch in front of them. So I have 10 gig internet pipe, I, do, I have a 10 gig span port here, then I insert an extra switch so that I spread the traffic across these guys. It turns out there's no good answer to the question, how should I spread the traffic? So what they did was uh, they programmed the switch through a controller so that these guys get approximately the same amount of traffic. So what they do is they program policy-based routing PBR rules in here. Obviously, being academics, they have to do this through OpenFlow because that's the new hype on the block and academic proposals have to mention SDN in OpenFlow. Otherwise, I was told you even don't get the grant money. <laughs> Uh, anyway, they nicely solved the problem of uh, having IDSs that are not powerful enough to analyze all the traffic. Because the only other solution is you buy a more powerful box from a reassuringly expensive vendor. Okay. Uh, then there's this thing that we've been doing for ages and no one knew it was called software-defined security. <laughs> Whenever someone is attacking you, one of the options is you just take the target server offline. Yeah, they won. The service is offline. But guess what? Your other services are still running. Whereas if you don't take that server offline, your WANG link will be saturated and you will have no service. So choose your poison. And it turns out that um, a lot a large number of large ISPs allow you to signal that to them with a BGP community. So the only thing you have to do is you have to start advertising a smaller prefix or a host route with that community, and they will kill all the traffic for that prefix or host route. Yeah, of course, the whole thing is offline, but at least other things still work. A uh, very similar solution from uh, Arbor Networks. They are one of those DDoS scrubbing companies. Uh, they would take the traffic and clean it up and send the cleaned up traffic to you. And of course, you can buy an appliance from them, which is cool. Uh, but the problem with that approach is that the appliance sits at the wrong place. It's behind the WAN link, which is already saturated, okay? So they have two other products. One is, uh, one has to sit in the service provider network and some service providers are using that. In which case you just start advertising your prefix, the prefix for your data center which, with a different BGP next hop which points to them. So all the traffic gets diverted there. They clean it up, they send it to you. And the third option is that uh, you use some sort of a tunnel with their cloud-based uh, data center. Oh, oh, no, in the third option, they have to advertise your prefix, otherwise there's no guarantee that the traffic will actually get there. Um, this thing is widely used in ISP environments. Every big ISP is using something like this. Um, enterprise networks are using this, usually manually. There's a kill switch that someone has to press, whereas service providers are sometimes using this automatically. And people like Arbor have automated this. And you know, if you trust that their appliance does what you think it should be doing, it's automatic. Um, there are people using uh, BGP flow spec, uh, also in production, like uh, Cloudflare is using this. Uh, BGP flow spec is a slightly more versatile mechanism that allows you to insert granular entries into your routers. So instead of saying kill all this, you could say, well, 
this address range is attacking this server on port 80. Let's kill that traffic. And because this is propagated through BGP, the moment your controller crashes, all these entries are gone. So if you have a software bug, you didn't do any major damage. Other people are doing the same things with uh, OpenFlow, which is just another mechanism to install packet filters in the boxes in their case. Okay? So they would have uh, some IDS. Um, a lot of people would use Bro IDS. It's like the best open source IDS. Uh, and they, the IDS would pass the data to the controller saying, well, we think this is bad. And then here you would have a controller or it could be just a simple set of scripts or what have you. And uh, this thing would take that definition of bad traffic and push it into the physical switch with the drop action attached at the end. So kill that. By the way, the beauty of using OpenFlow is that OpenFlow has an idle timeout built in. So if you don't see any traffic on this particular matching pattern for a while because the attacker gave up, the flow disappears automatically. You don't have to care about removing it. Um, I know people who are using this in production. Still, I wouldn't claim it's ready for production deployments. That guy is brave. Uh, and now for things that work better in PowerPoint. So uh, I know that they, this thing has been demonstrated. It is technically valid. But would I use it in production? Well, if I would have to, yes, maybe. <laughs> Otherwise, no. Um, I'm positive that there are other people doing this same stuff. But the one where I found this information was a demo between Arista Switch and Palo Alto Firewall. And it's a really interesting hack. Initially, all the traffic goes through the firewall as you would expect. You have two different subnets, the red subnet and the black subnet. Traffic flows through the firewall, which is okay until someone decides to do backup over this firewall. And now I don't know how Palo Alto deals with that. I know some other firewalls could just flip over. They crash if they are overloaded. I had a customer once that had exactly this problem. They were doing backups through the network and the firewalls crashed. Um, so what we would love to see is that after the firewall says, well, this is backup, can we get rid of that? That the switch would install a shortcut. Now, how do you get a Palo Alto firewall to talk to an Arista switch? It's hard. Now, luckily, Every single firewall on the market supports something called logging. And every single firewall would do logging on the syslog port. So what if we would have a syslog server on this Arista switch? And remember, the beauty of an Arista switch is that it runs Linux. And it's not hidden like in Nexus 7000. And it's not crazily protected like in uh, Juniper devices. No, you log into Linux. This thing happens to be doing packet forwarding, but it's a Linux server. So of course, you can install a syslog server on a Linux server. And uh, then you get the log messages. And then you write a simple, well, in their case, I think it was Python script which would look at the log messages and if they would find the log message with the right whatever, they would extract the, the IP addresses and the port numbers and install a shortcut. So the syslog message gets here and the Python script running on this box would say, ah, okay, firewall said that's okay, so I will install a shortcut. 
anything coming from this IP address to this, to the, this other IP address with this source and destination port numbers goes straight through. So the firewall never ever sees that particular backup session any longer. Okay? As I said, looks great. Test it first. Uh, and now for some other stuff. So how much time I have left? Eight minutes, great. Um, I knew I wouldn't have time to go through all this or you would be here till 5 p.m. Uh, people are doing service insertion, for example, with Cisco ACI, which is the idea of dynamically inserting a firewall, for example, in the forwarding path. So in Cisco ACI, for example, you would have these endpoint groups and uh, you would specify packet filters between them. And then all of a sudden you would go like, no, this is not good enough. I want to have a firewall between these two endpoint groups. And the fabric would shift the traffic to the firewall and then collect it and send it back to the destination. Uh, and that happens automatically. And that actually works. It's not just a PowerPoint feature. Um, People are using programmable network taps, uh, either programming span sessions automatically or configuring filters in the tap aggregation network. And uh, I know that Microsoft has this in production in one of their clouds. They're using an Arista switch. And Arista has this nice feature of running Linux, right? So you can run Chef or Puppet or Ansible or whatever is, is your preferred automation tool on an Arista switch and they manage all the span sessions and everything through such a tool. Uh, network monitoring. People are doing stuff like uh, using x86 based solutions instead of NetFlow probes in overly expensive switches. So I have a great story on this front. Someone was given a simple task. We have 10 gig ethernet connection to the internet and we want you to collect data on every single session established to and from the internet. Obviously the first question would be why do you need that data? But he was not in the position to ask that question. So he said, well, no problem. My core switch to which this pipe is connected has NetFlow on the line cards. They were expensive. Well, it turned out that those line cards didn't do full NetFlow. They only did sampled NetFlow, which means you collect like every thousand packets, which is really useful if you want to see every session, right? So it was totally useless. So he figured out that there is this open source software called uh, NTOP. Oh, now it's NTOP NG. And the package solution is NProbe, where you get a, a VM or an ISO image with everything. And that thing can do packet capture and uh, NetFlow collection, well, record generation at 10 gig speeds on, I think he was using like a Dell server that cost him $2,000. And the beauty of that is he said, well, now I had NetFlow data and then I figured out that this thing can also interact directly with my Elk stack, which is Elasticsearch, uh, Logstash and Cabana, which is one another open source tool that people are using instead of Splunk. So he got that data straight into his Splunk-like open source tool and could you know, use graphs to display what sessions were doing and so on and so on. So never underestimate the power of x86 server combined with well-written software. As long as it's not in Java. Um, okay. Now, as from deployment readiness perspective, some things are products, some things are just concepts, maybe with a proof of concept Python script like that firewall bypass feature, 
uh, there are a lot of open source things out there that sometimes you can just take and use. Sometimes you have to do some work to make it useful to your environment, but at least you have a starting point. It ranges for all the way from shipping products like Cisco's ACI or VMware NSX or all the others I had on that list or Amazon Web Services to do-it-yourself frameworks like Ansible or uh, Puppet or Chef where you get this framework and then you have to write your own stuff. Anyway, this is the path you should be taking. Go out and Rodrigo told you how to explore, right? Don't spend the year. <laughs> he might have a year, you don't. Um, collect stuff, evaluate, pilot deployment, and I hope that a year from now, one of you will stand up here and talk about at least a pilot project, if not deployment experience which would be totally awesome, so please do it. If you need more information, uh, I have a whole range of webinars on my website, so go there and explore. Uh, I put together an SDN-specific page, so whenever someone asks me, well, where could I start learning about SDN? I'm like, oh, have you tried sdn.ipspace.net? Because there are like 50 links there. Uh, and stay in touch. So if you get a question after the uh, troopers when you get home and you go like, ah, this crazy guy was talking about this interesting thing, uh, but I forgot what he was saying, send me an email. I try to reply to all of them. The only problem I have with replying to emails is sometimes you send me such a good question that I go like, yeah, I should really take time to write a proper reply. And that happens like six months later. <laughs> Speaking about questions, we still have two minutes left. So if there are any questions right now, please. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, thank you. I have one question regarding the uh, automation and uh, simulation. If you have the playbooks to deploy the environment. You could simulate what it's doing and you could also simulate traffic. Do you, are you aware of uh, tools doing this or being developed? Like Skybox um, or there were Arbo, um, the Arc Algosec things they're doing, simulating traffic to firewalls. Uh, there were tools doing something like you mentioned. Uh, what was the tool's name? I <laughs> can't remember it. But, you, you know, I, uh, so far, well, I, I'm positive there are more tools out there and they're so expensive that no one talks about them. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, there was this one tool and I can't remember the name. And they got acquired by someone else, so now it's a completely different name anyway. And they were actually simulating packets traversing the network. Um, so that was like the most realistic one I've ever seen. Now, these days, most people don't even try to simulate stuff because most everything is available in virtual form. Mm -hmm. So uh, why should I try to simulate stuff if I could just deploy the real stuff in virtual environment and see how it works? It's obvious for uh, virtual machines but uh, VM versions are also available for routers and switches from almost all major vendors in one form or another. Yeah, but then you are back to the problem Amazon had and you need to kindly identify what is really deployed and what, what happens. Yeah. Um, yeah, I, I understand what you are asking, but no. Yeah. Okay. Uh, I haven't seen anything that would be doing something more formal. Mm -hmm. Okay, thanks. Unfortunately. <laughs> I would love to have it. Okay, um, first, just as a comment, uh, the uh, hypervisors you commented on was uh, for the 
homegrown services only KVM, Hyper-V, and VMware, and Xen was for one reason or another missing, but Amazon EC2 was on the list. That just Zen, doesn't... Is, Zen is the same thing. Okay. Uh, I, I totally agree. Uh, as long as you have any Linux-based virtualization solution uh, that uses standard Linux switch, where IP tables apply, mm. you can use this. Okay. So it could which, be Zen, KVM, VirtualBox, if you wish. Which brings me to the second aspect. You entirely left out Docker, Docker networks, all this setting up the entire stack in the Docker file and having all this interconnecting service chaining aspects that Docker mm -hmm. brings. Um, well, you see, you, you also get that same thing in more traditional environments. Uh, it's just that because Docker started later, they understood the problem better and integrated it better. So you can get uh, but, but most of the things that you would get from the networking perspective in Docker with something like Cloudify or Okay, but there is no special reason why Docker was left out in this. No, system. no. From the from the networking perspective, I treat Docker as a high density virtualization solution. Thanks again, Ivan. Yeah.